This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute, welcoming you to our transcript series of Spring 2012 events. On March 21, 2012, we were fortunate to host two speakers from the medical branch of the Canadian Forces. At the Security Studies Committee luncheon recorded in a separate podcast, Surgeon General Commodore Hans Jung addressed the gathering on the health impact of CF operations. That evening, at Military History Night, Dr. Major Andrew Beckett spoke on his experiences as a combat surgeon at Kandahar Airfield. Dr. Beckett. Thank you all for uh, the warm welcome uh, to our CMI uh, Military History Night. And uh, it's a real privilege uh, to be here tonight, and, uh, and it's actually even more of a privilege to uh, represent uh, the other members of Canadian Forces Health Services that are serving overseas, still on the op attention, and uh, that are working around the world. Um, and uh, I feel s- slightly upstage because my uh, ultimate boss, the Surgeon General, was here at RCMI. He was, uh, he was speaking here today, and... Uh, and uh, there, uh, many of them are done at the military, uh, sort of the uh, medical hall of fame uh, induction night uh, tonight in Toronto. So I think many of my colleagues are down there. Um, so uh, when I first saw his name on the bill before me, I thought, well, anyways, I, I was uh, a little bit uh, wondering if there, anybody was going to show up to mine because you've heard from the boss, you don't need to listen to this guy. Uh, but anyways, I'm glad you're all here tonight, and uh, it's a real privilege to be here. So uh, as I said. As, uh, as I introduced, I'm Andrew Beckett. I'm a, a military uh, trauma surgeon uh, with, the, with the forces out of uh, uh, one Canadian field hospital in Petawawa. Uh, I've had a long history of the forces, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but first, I have several apologies. Uh, so Combat Hospital was a TV show that ran over the summer when global, global uh, operation with Global TV. And it was, uh, it was a big... Uh, uh, it's a really good advertisement for the Canadian Forces Health Services, and the Surgeon General uh, really supported it. And, and for probably one reason is not any other arm of the Canadian Forces had a TV show made about them in the last uh, the last 20 years. So it's a great advertisement for us. Um, but he had a couple caveats about this, and I remember him saying about it. He said, you know, it's not going to be a mash. There's not going to be making fun of the military or any of the patients or or the military uh, service in general. Uh, so that's one, that's one caveat. And uh, one of my mentors, uh, uh, Colonel Homer Tien, was also one of the writers, the uh, medical writers for the show. Uh, so it was really interesting to see them involved in that. And, uh, and certainly that gave us a lot of exposure. Unfortunately, the, the show what, is not being uh, renewed, apparently. But anyways, I think it gave us a lot of, uh, gave a lot of press. And, but the, the apology is for... Uh, unfortunately, a lot of us in these pictures, including myself, are not as good looking as the people you saw on the TV show, <laughs> unfortunately. So if you're hoping for some really good looking people on the show, uh, on, the, on this slideshow, uh, it's not, it's not going to happen. Um, and a little bit about myself. Uh, uh, as my, my dad was, was proudly says, I'm a high school dropout. I, I, I joined the Army when I was 18, and I joined as in the Canadian Force of Health Services as a uh, medical technician, and I wound up in the infantry as a medic and did a couple uh, tours in Yugoslavia during that time. So, so I, I got to see what you know, some of the real little medical military realities are on the ground and what, what the medics go through on the ground trying to take a look after patients. And uh, So I have a lot of time for those guys, and certainly those guys in Afghanistan have made the life and, uh, difference between life and death between, uh, for many of our casualties. And, uh, you know, I always show this picture, especially to the younger guys, because it shows a time when I actually had uh, black hair. And uh, so I always show this picture to them. And, uh, and I, I, hopefully it gives me some uh, street credibility with them. But uh, anyways, I, I just put that in, mostly for a laugh. So this is the reality of what's uh, in Afghanistan, how we get around some of the people there I was there with. Uh, and... Uh, Many of you, I understand, have been in Afghanistan and uh, worked there in the past, and uh, and some of these realities you know very well. So, Afghanistan is a dangerous place, and just to to get around just outside the perimeter, you have to get into a vehicle like this, and fully wearing all your personal protective equipment, including helmet, uh, fragmentation vests, fully loaded with weapons, and these are just doctors getting transited around. So, uh, Afghanistan is a dangerous place. Um, 
you know, I'd like to say, you know, I did a lot of the stuff going outside the wire and doing, uh, uh, you know, seeing a lot of uh, action out there, but the reality is not. Uh, I spent most of my time wearing uh, scrubs and being in the hospital, and after a while being in the hospital, it's like any other place. Uh, you're uh, working with surgeons, anesthetists, uh, other physicians, and patients, and so very quickly you just become back into your regular routine of being a, being a surgeon. So uh, Afghanistan, as you know, it's, uh, it's surrounded by a lot of neighbors that are not so great uh, people, uh, include Pakistan, uh, Uzbekistan, and over here is Iran. Um, so it, right, and it touches China over here. So it, it's got a lot of bad neighbors, and that's part of its problem, and it's a completely landlocked country, and, uh, um, and it's been a pathway for invasions for probably thousands of years, and uh, that sort of tradition continues. So I'll just give you a little bit of historical background on the uh, of medical care in Afghanistan or some of the research that's been done. And, you know, really what we did in Kandahar is we brought in first world medical care into a war-devastated country. And it just shows that the ca capacity for our medical services to bring first world care to anywhere in the world and bring leading edge technology, it doesn't matter where it is, we can set it up and do it. Um, and I have to give credit to a lot of the people I got there sort of late in the game, uh, but a lot of the people that arrived there first, uh, I mean, they had to set everything up from scratch. But I think it's a real tribute to uh, them and to Canadian Forces Health Services that we can do this anywhere in the world. So, as you know, it's, it's one of the poorest countries in the world, and this population is actually probably pretty similar to ours. So, in terms of the medical research, uh, um, uh, you know, there's not a lot of services there, and only about 30% of healthcare facilities had any kind of surgical coverage after hours, and I'd say this is probably pretty optimistic. Um, and, uh, and only 20, about 30% had anesthetists. So let's imagine if you have to show up somewhere for an operation that you have people that uh, either the hospital is not working or you have people that are improperly trained to deal with your health care emergency. So less than half of them could perform an life uh, emergency life-saving surgery and uh, less than half of them had any functioning anesthesia equipment. And certainly I saw some of the patients there and it was very rudimentary and uh, primitive sometimes at best. Um, most of them uh, really had not the capacity to transfuse blood if needed. And simple things like trying to take, uh, if somebody has an airway obstruction, trying to put a hole in the neck to get around the airway obstruction or to re remove a foreign body is less than half of them can do that. So you might ask, well, how many people are actually uh, getting killed in Afghanistan? And, you know, how many people are actually dying? It's uh, about 10,000 between 2007 and 2010, and the number changes depending on the reference you read. Um, you know, but the bulk of these people are still killed by the Taliban, and the minority are, are, are killed uh, by uh, coalition forces as a collateral damage, but the majority are still killed by uh, Taliban forces. And this number will bounce around, uh, but it seems pretty predominant in the literature that uh, the Taliban is doing most of the... Uh, the uh, killing of civilians. So in, in Kandahar, as, uh, in, we brought this first world hospital into Afghanistan, um, but you know, you just we wind up treating a lot of civilian patients that are injured by the uh, in the collateral damage of war, and we have to have a place to send them after we've treated them or done the best. We just can't keep them forever or send them back to Canada. So uh, there's a hospital in Canada called uh, Mir Weiss Hospital, and it's an international uh, Red Cross, International Committee of the Red Cross Hospital, or ICRC Hospital. Um, and uh, and it really runs on a very skeleton-type frame. Um, and in fact, at one point, it was called a little better than a vector of infection uh, for treating patients. Um, and uh, we try to work with these uh, ICRC uh, quite closely uh, because we have to have somewhere to send these civilian patients and we try to support them when possible and uh, they're sometimes reticent to, to receive support uh, because they're, uh, they're trying to preserve their neutrality um, so it's a bit of a give and take type situation but we do try to work with them closely um, in terms of patient care. 
Um, and I, I never went there because uh, going into Kandahar City is a, is a major enterprise, but Life magazine went there, and these are just some of the images that uh, were taken from uh, the hospital there. And you can see somewhat uh, primitive sort of settings with uh, not very good surroundings for patients. But anyways, we're going to talk a little bit now about where soldiers actually injured in combat, because we're going to talk about combat injuries on patients and and uh, it, it's remarkable when you go through the literature, not much has changed in terms of the distribution of the injuries and what people are dying from, from the, uh, the Revolutionary War in the, in the United States to uh, uh, Kandahar and uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. So not much has changed. Um, so if you look at the number of injuries, most people have soft tissue injuries from uh, war wounds, uh, about, about uh, 47% over here. So... Um, and the other 25% of the core of the pie is from extremity injuries, so arms, legs, uh, that sort of thing. 8% of the abdomen, 4% of the chest. And, and then this, uh, this sort of collection over here is, makes up about a, a third, or a, yeah, I guess about a third or a quarter. Um, but this is the bulk thing that we see, and certainly that we saw that in Kandahar, is, is you see lots of uh, fragmentation injuries that... Uh, not, they're just basically your flesh wound that everybody hopes to get. So how are people wounded? Uh, so people wounded in wartime, um, only about a quarter of people were actually received a gunshot wound. Um, about uh, two-thirds, almost two-thirds were they're from fragmentation from either uh, artillery shell, mortar shell, uh, roadside bomb, what have you. And then this little collection is the, the uh, remainder. Now, it's interesting in terms of what you see in military casualties, and doctors love numbers, and I suppose that you went to the Surgeon General presentation, you probably saw a lot of numbers, and, and it's basically to sort out where the maximum value for our effort is and uh, you know, where we can make a difference. But you look at, uh, these are all American, not effective rates, so, so why are we losing people out of the forces? And you look like here is, most people are lost to disease, and only about uh, only about 20% are, are lost to combat injuries, so, and that's, that holds true today. The majority of people that get sent home from Afghanistan or Iraq or where have you are are from uh, disease processes, and only about 20% are from actual uh, wound, wounded in action. So, again, just looking at the data from going back from World War One to uh, to Somalia. Uh, again, it's, it's the uh, limbs and extremities that tend to suffer the most amount of uh, wounds. And the, probably, is a, what you're wondering, why is everybody getting wounded in the arms and legs? Um, probably a lot of people that get that uh, sustain injuries to the head or the chest, they, they die and they never make it to any kind of casualty collection point, and then they just die there, and so they don't get included in this. So, the lethality of war wounds. Um, um, has actually really gone down, and it's probably even lower than it is now. So back in the Revolutionary War, it was about 42%. If you sustained any kind of war wound, you had a little, about almost a 50% chance of dying. And that was from poor medical treatment, poor evacuation, uh, infections, uh, septic shock, uh, things like that. Um, and going down, so as medical casualty evacuation got better, World War I, 21%. World War II, it went up a little bit, mostly because of the uh, campaigns in the, the Far East with uh, problems with transportation. And by Vietnam, it went back down to 24%. And they stayed at 24% in the Persian Gulf War. And now we've got it down to 10%, or probably even less. And that's due to advances in transfusion, uh, antibiotics, uh, rapid evacuation systems and uh, better uh, post-operative care, etc. So that's what wounds people and gets people in the hospital. What kills them? Um, so one of the big things that we still haven't figured out is uh, killed in action, um, uh, brain injuries. So we still not have not come up with a good way to fix these. And a lot of people that sustain brain injuries, whether it be in combat or on the 401, um, we still don't have an answer to fix those people. I do quite a bit of work at uh, Sunnybrook Hospital, 
And we have several, every week we have several young people dying from brain injuries, and there's just nothing you can do to fix these easily. And, uh, so we don't have an answer for that. So surgically uncorrectable torso trauma, this, this is the person that's shot in the chest into a big blood vessel like the aorta, and then they just bleed to death so rapidly they're never even seen by any medical professionals. Surgically correctable uh, torso trauma people dying from, well, they're bleeding, but from the torso, somewhere from the chest or the abdomen, but they, they just don't make it to a facility. But if they made it there fast enough, we could fix them. Now we're getting into the things uh, that we saw in a lot in Afghanistan. Uh, blast, mutilating trauma, that this is the person that's blown apart and there's just nothing you can do to salvage this person. Now we're getting into things that we've really made a difference in. So, killed in action, exsanguination from extremity rooms. 9% of people were dying from bleeding from the arm or leg. So, in the Canadian Forces, we've shown in a recent study that we've almost reduced this number to zero. We've had nobody die from uh, bleeding from the arm or leg. And you're like, well, how have you guys done that? And it's because of something called a Tactile Combat Casualty Care Program. And what we enforce is anybody with a leg wound that was, or an arm wound that was bleeding massively, we'd have a tourniquet put on right away. And some of our soldiers carry one or two or three tourniquets. Um, and we've had many people saved by putting a tourniquet on. Uh, because these are not civilian injuries. Um, the tourniquet went out of favor in the 1960s when, they, uh, when there was more sort of civilian input into these guidelines. Uh, but now we know that tourniquets in combat situations save lives. Other things is that we've done is, is how to resuscitate people. Um, we've done better learning how to use blood products more effectively and to get these people back. The other thing that we've learned and uh, made uh, interventions on is killed in action, tension pneumothorax. And this is when you get air trapped around the lung, compressing the lung, collapses the lung, and the person can't breathe and can die of a collapse that way. And we've all taught all our medics and many of our soldiers how to decompress this and get the air out from around the lungs so the person can breathe. And the last thing we've done is uh, killed in action, airway obstruction. Is taught many of our soldiers how to do a cricothyroidotomy or make a small hole in the neck to get around that airway obstruction so the person can, the person can breathe. So that's... Uh, made big differences on the battlefield of Afghanistan and Iraq. So how many people we lost and you know we were you know we were up there in numbers as many of you know uh, into the 160s now with the latest death coming on October 29th. I was actually in theater. Uh, I just arrived and we uh, were passed by the area where he, where he had been uh, killed. And it was a big bomb. Um, and he blew up one of these rhino vehicles, a heavily armored vehicle. And uh, it just shows you can you can build build a, a armored vehicle as big as you want, uh, but if you get enough explosives, you can blow up anything, and uh, that's what happened. They found the uh, axles about 200 meters away from the vehicle. So my mentor, as I was saying, uh, Colonel Homer Chen, he did this study looking at what they did in uh, Kandahar from 2006. Uh, where they had one general surgeon, one orthopedic surgeon, two anesthetists, nine war beds, and only three ICU beds. Much bigger now. And you can see the majority of the patients they were treating at that time were uh, coalition soldiers, so American, Dutch, uh, Italians, etc. Canadian military, about 20%. Other uh, prisoners, six. And a lot of them are Afghan army and Afghan police. Um, and these Afghan army and Afghan police take up a lot of brunt of the casualties. And it's due to uh, equipment, training issues, uh, etc. And just that they're, the Afghan National Police really uh, take a beating when, when, when they're out in these areas, as many of you know. And also, a lot of civilians, including many children. And that's one thing you, you don't really realize as a trauma surgeon. Most of the people I operate on for trauma are, are adults. Um, many of them... Uh, they can be older people as well, but when you get over there, you're operating on a lot of children that are just injured in the collateral damage of war. So the case that they were doing there, um, majority of them, oops, still back, majority of them were extremity injuries, so arm and leg fractures. Um, 
with laparotomy or entrance into the abdominal cavity to fix something or chest injuries. But again, just showing that this is consistent is that is that a majority of war injuries that we would see are extremity injuries or arm and leg injuries. The majority of injuries that we're seeing there are from blast. Um, they're from the roadside bombs. Uh, penetrating injuries, about 29%, so from uh, fragment or from a gunshot wound. Blood trauma, vehicle rollovers or falls, so 25%, and burns, 1%. And the mean age was 28, so it's a pretty young patient population. So at that time, they only had 6% in hospital deaths. And you have to realize is that a lot of these people are very severely injured, and that's a testament to the work that was being done there. So anybody that arrived to the hospital, they only had a 6% chance of dying. Uh, so those are pretty remarkable figures. And, and uh, civilian hospitals struggle to get those kind of numbers as well. The majority of deaths that they saw were from penetrating trauma from gunshot wound or fragmentation wound. And uh, seven were from brain injury deaths. And as I previously said, there's not a lot you can do with that sometimes. They only had six people die of exsanguination or six people that bled to death. Um, and then a uh, you know, small collection of other people that died from various causes. So this is, uh, this is me on Christmas Day in uh, 2010 in Kandahar. And this is uh, Canada House here, which some of you may recognize. This is the Canadian Christmas tree uh, that was shipped over. Uh, and, you know, the Americans, they, uh, they were shipping over 16-foot Christmas trees in uh, C-17 aircraft. Yeah, so, so everybody got a Christmas tree in the Americans. This is our Christmas tree that was shipped over. But I'm going to give you a tour of sort of day in the life in uh, Kandahar now. So I've got through some of the dry stuff. Um, this is the actual, this is the hospital actually in, in, uh, in uh, Kandahar now. Before it was built of plywood, tents, uh, sea containers, etc. But now this is, a, this is a hardened structure. So it's a bunkerized structure. It's been designed to take uh, uh, direct rocket, uh, rocket fire. Um, still when I was there, there was... Uh, probably about two rocket attacks a day, um, 82 millimeter uh, rockets, Chinese rockets being fired into the camp. And we had several deaths from the rocket attacks uh, during my time there. This is all Kandahar Airfield Base. And it's, this is a base of, um, when I was there, 30,000 people. Uh, so it was a large number of people there. And it's a really amazing to see the sort of canvas of war that goes on there. And this base is sitting right in the middle of uh, countryside where... Uh, rockets are being lobbed at it and uh, so a lot of it, everything is being supplied by air so you have aircraft landing around the clock to keep this place uh, resupplied so this picture is taken from the uh, control tower of the airfield so this is coming up to the hospital and this is the uh, this is the trauma bay here at the hospital going into the hospital here and this is how the patients come in this is a Black Hawk uh, medevac helicopter and then the helicopters usually start coming in in the early afternoon um, when operations start picking up. Uh, usually there's not too much in the morning, but by early afternoon, the helicopters start coming in. And sometimes they just keep coming in. What we would do is the helicopter would be coming in. Uh, this is a Chinook uh, medevac helicopter coming in. And we'd have our uh, medical ambulance crews waiting to pick them up. Uh, so they wait till the helicopter lands and they can start uh, loading the patients up on the, the ambulances. Just uh, you can see the mountains uh, are surrounding the camp there. So loading the patients up onto the ambulances and coming up to the trauma bay. This is uh, the trauma bay being loaded at night. Sometimes the uh, patient transfers and uh, casualties come in late into the night. And many times patients are transferred from surrounding institutions uh, or hospitals, uh, uh, particularly the hospital in, uh, at Camp Bastion in Helmand Province, uh, which is uh, cooperatively run by the, the Brits and the U U.S. forces. And so they would transfer patients to us at night, mostly because the, uh, the tactical situation, they get less uh, uh, ground fire when they were uh, moving at night. So we bring the patients into the trauma into the trauma bay, and this is where we start initially assessing them and resuscitating them and triaging them for further treatment. And it's really interesting mix of people. So we have uh, uh, Americans, uh, and everybody's still wearing their sidearms, uh, Canadians, and uh, we have UK forces working there at the same time. Um, and so you start getting there, start getting an idea of their injuries uh, and what you're going to do about them. 
Uh, the surgeons, we kind of stand off to the side and sort of let some of the dust settle, and we're going to start picking who we're going to take to the operating room, in which order we're going to take people down. We can do all our x-rays there, um, and after we get them x-rayed and get them stabilized, most of the time we prefer to get them to uh, the CAT scanner, take some pictures, and make sure we know, we know exactly what we're dealing with. Because of the nature of fragmentation injuries, there's going to be multiple fragments, and you just don't know where every fragment has traveled, uh, especially when you get in the operating room. So it's very useful to have those pictures to really see where every fragment has wound up and identify the injuries and come up with a plan how you're going to fix them. So if they're stabilized, we'll take them to the CAT scanner. So then we take them through the doors into the operating room. And they, this was a sign taken from the old, uh, old building. So we get them into the operating room and uh, get ready for our cases. And then we'll take them over to the, uh, we'll take them over to the ICU. Now, this hospital is it's probably nicer than some of the hospitals I've worked in and trained in in Canada. And it's, it's completely designed as a trauma hospital. Uh, and you have easy flow through right from the trauma bay, right to the CT scanner, and right to the operating room, and right to the ICU. Um, so it's actually real, very well designed. Uh, these are patients that, that wind up in the ICU. So and if you're not so lucky, you wind up in one of these. This is the hearse in Afghanistan. Now, I don't know how many have seen hearses around here, but this is a double-decker hearse with just metal, and I've seen it filled up with, with casualties uh, that uh, haven't made it or uh, that we've triaged them, and they're just dead coming in. Um, there was an incident there. The, uh, there was a suicide bomber went on to a U.S. Marine base and uh, detonated and killed eight Marines. Um, so most of them were dead on arrival. Um, and uh, there was actually, the eight of them showed up dead, and there was two that just walked in. They just had very minor injuries, but there was eight dead. And, uh, so, I, yeah, I've seen this fill, filled up several times. These are... These are the uh, freezer lockers where uh, casualties that don't make it wind up. After you've done all that, you've done your cases, you've been in the hospital for 28 hours, you walk through the uh, lanes of Kandahar, and it's kind of like walking through a medieval city or a rabbit warren where there's all these blast walls to prevent uh, rocket fire from <coughs> destroying too many buildings or protect buildings. So, uh, so you walk through all these avenues, and this is leading up to the Canadian... Uh, Roll one uh, facility, and then you wind up at Tim Hortons for a coffee uh, and have a coffee. And uh, there's none of this that you may have seen in the TV show. That, that was uh, that was uh, forbidden there, so there was none of that. So. But one thing they do have for the morale there is uh, the uh, this is a Belgian uh, patrol dog, and uh, the. Uh, the dog handlers will bring in their dogs for morale purposes to give you a bit of a show and let you play with the dog. So that's one, one thing you do for morale there. So it's a pretty, uh, uh, it's a circumstance where you go to work every day. There's, you don't, don't get days off. Um, you, there's, I think during my time there for Christmas, I think we had, we're allowed two beers at Christmas time. And that was about the only alcohol we had, uh, the whole time. And, so there's very little else to do there but work. So when people bring in the dogs or something like that, it makes, it makes it uh, uh, kind of a special event. So during my time there, I, I, we just published this in a, the uh, uh, medical journal called Injury uh, in, on the British publication. Um, so during the time there, is the, there was uh, almost 2,500 uh, trauma patients uh, seen. And... Uh, Majority of them were actually NATO, NATO soldiers, um, also Afghan security forces, and also uh, there were still quite a few civilians being seen there, local nationals, 581. But some of the numbers that you would never see here in Canada, um, uh, these numbers of blood, uh, pack red blood cells being uh, transfused, so units of blood, uh, 4,000, uh, FFP, plasma, 3,800, Platelets. I mean, these numbers are massive numbers of blood being transfused there, and these were all because of the, na the devastating nature of injuries, which I'm going to show you a few pictures. One thing that you probably won't see here in any civilian facility, or rarely, is triple amputation patients, so patients that lose three or more limbs. 
and uh, and that's a pretty common injury in Afghanistan. Where I was there. And these are just some more medical type numbers, but here is something important: is improvised explosive device or no found source, so roadside bomb, 915. Um, Gunshot wound, 327. And then you see other mechanisms of injury that you would never hear of here, including a hand grenade, uh, um, helicopter crash. Uh, so you see all these injuries that uh, you, know, you rarely see in civilian practice. So I'm going to take you through a few cases. Uh, and uh, some of the, these are patients of, uh, these are actual uh, pictures of casualties. Uh, so I use your discretion when, when talking to your friends or, or distributing them. Um, and uh, this is a case uh, that was uh, that I saw when I was there. It was a 28-year-old uh, Canadian sergeant. Uh, and uh, they were on patrol, and a roadside bomb went off, and uh, four other casualties were at the scene. And uh, one, of the, one of the Canadian guys, he was, uh, he was killed there. And the thing that, you know, this is the first time I saw a Canadian killed in action uh, or, or die in action in the trauma bay is like, is you see the uh, pictures they always flash on the media, and uh, and then when you actually see them in person, you just realize how young they are, um, and uh, and so that's uh, that's one of the things that struck me about that. So so we have all about five Canadians uh, coming into the uh, um, the trauma bay. Um, so the the comrade was killed. He was essentially really uh, blown in half by this uh, the uh, device. So, uh, so obviously he had to, this fellow had off triple amputation, facial injuries. Uh, the medics at the scene seen that did a great job. Uh, they were able to get a breathing tube in and put tourniquets on him, as I was mentioning in the past. And they, um, it's very difficult to get intravenous access on people when their arms and legs are missing. Um, so we can actually go into the bone and give people blood products and uh, resuscitation fluids through the through the bone, which they did. Um, so they actually had him in the airfield in 45 minutes of wounding. Uh, we uh, got some big IV sites in, and we started giving him some blood. We got some antibiotics on board. Uh, one thing that it's easy to forget there, but all these little steps are important for us. Um, if you don't give the person antibiotics, they get infected. If you don't give them uh, tetanus, is the uh, people can develop tetanus there. And we had there was one case there where tetanus uh, was neglected to be given, and uh, the person developed tetanus. So all these little things you have to keep in mind. So anyways, we do everything in a systematic way, the ABC way, and uh, trying to control all these things, starting with his airway and his breathing and his circulation or blood pressure and disability, his neurological function, and just trying to find out where all the wounds are. So this is what he looked like coming in. So um, You can see here is we've got some tourniquets placed on there now, and these are the remnants of his lower legs. Uh, so, and these are all contaminated wounds with mud and dirt and pieces of equipment, and et cetera. So we did some x-rays and got them all uh, fixed up for the operating room. Did an x-ray. Um, normally a pelvis doesn't look like this. This is your pelvis open wide, and this is from the other blast injury. Uh, the remnants of the leg completely shattered. <coughs> So anyways, uh, we took him to the operating room, and uh, war surgery is pretty dirty surgery. It's, everything's contaminated, uh, so you're really trying to get rid of all the dirt, all the dead tissue. Uh, you're trying to get back to healthy bleeding tissue um, so you can save the remnant of the leg. Uh, and sometimes you always try to err on the side of caution. If you think something is going to maybe okay, you'll come back and take a look at it. But... A lot of times, a lot of the muscle and other tissue is just dead and has to uh, has to be taken off. And the CAT scan, um, this is a CAT scan of the skull. But what you can see, all these little white parts here, these are all parts from the bomb that are embedded in the face. Um, and these all have to be taken out and washed out. And so that's what it looks like. Uh, so you get, and you can multiple little fragments everywhere, and these all have to be taken out. Uh, so this is what war surgery looks like. Uh, these are amputated uh, femurs here. This is going up to the groin and scrotum. And this is a very typical injury from a uh, roadside bomb. The operating rooms, uh, it can be quite uncomfortable to work there because we have multiple teams trying to work on the same person at one time. Um, 
Uh, you'll have maybe two sets of surgeons working on the lower extremities, one maybe one on the abdomen, maybe one on the upper chest or the arm. Uh, and we're all trying to do things at once, so we can get pretty cramped in there. Um, and also, also it's very warm, very warm in there. We need to try to keep the rooms as warm as possible, uh, so the patient doesn't get cold. So a lot of times you're sweating in there, trying, trying to get stuff done. And we know we've only got a limited amount of time. Is is one thing we've learned in trauma surgery is is uh, people that have suffered a blast injury, you don't try to finish the operation in one go. You try and do the bare minimum to stop the bleeding, get rid of some of the contamination, and get them with the back to the ICU so we can get warmed up. You can continue transfusing them. Uh, and because uh, these people are, they're very close to their physiological envelope of dying. Um, so you have to be as fast as possible and uh, get what you need to get done and then get them back to the ICU. So this is the product of what it uh, looks like coming back. Um, uh, bilateral amputations, amputation of upper extremity, uh, abdomen opened and then uh, fixation of the pelvis to bring everything back together. Um, and uh, and uh, many of these people are sent home like this. So that's another product of war is just the, uh, the buckets after uh, these cases. Blood products, we go through lots of blood products in these cases. Um, the uh, American Red Cross, at the time I was there, they were supplying uh, uh, the blood products. Um, and, but occasionally we'll run out of blood products to give and uh, there is a walking blood bank. Um, so soldiers that have been pre-screened uh, and willing to donate blood, so they'll be called in to start donating blood. That's uh, just the operating rooms after the uh, after the cases are done. That's just uh, sort of the remnants of just the, and this is just a more minor type case, but that's what it usually looks like. So after these cases, even though the patient didn't suffer any chest injuries, uh, just because of the uh, overpressurization from uh, the blast. The lungs can get injured, uh, uh, just like a balloon can pop when it's exposed to a lot of pressure, so can the lungs. So the lungs, they start developing bruises on the inside of them, and then you're, when your lungs are bruised, they don't work too good, like any other part of your body, and they become extreme, breathing becomes difficulty, difficult, and they wind up on the ventilator. So he was uh, put on the ventilator. So after we got all that done, we uh, uh, plan to send these guys back to Germany as soon as possible as we can arrange AeroVac. Usually there's one AeroVac going out per day. Um, so uh, they'll be flown to Germany where for further definitive surgery. But they'll stop at Bagram first. Uh, Bagram Airfield is near Kabul and they'll stop at uh, Kabul first to uh, be further evaluated. Maybe some more surgery done. Maybe some more uh, washing out will be done there. So this is just one of the air medevacs getting ready to leave there. And on the, the back of these things, it's basically like an ICU. So these, these uh, airplanes are well uh, equipped to deal with uh, very severely injured patients moving back uh, to uh, Bagram and beyond. So a lot of this stuff has been uh, put into databases and, uh, and uh, or the joint theater, joint trauma theater uh, registry. Um, and also, there's all protocols made up for these uh, these type of patients, and we try to follow these protocols as well as we can. And there are guidelines. Sometimes we have to, you know, it's a guideline, but uh, uh, we try to standardize everything as well as we can for the days in communication and just standardization of patient care. So many of the things I talked about were the damage control resuscitation, uh, which is actually a t term taken from the Navy. Um, so damage control is you're trying to get the ship back to port and to live to fight another day. And that's what we do in the operating room. We just do the bare minimum to keep the ship afloat, and then we'll try to get back to port and live to fight another day. High bilateral amputations, uh, that's another protocol that's been written. Fresh hole blood transfusions, that's a protocol that's been written. And management of war wounds and pelvic fracture care. So these are all protocols that we, uh, we, we, we try to follow. Uh, second case, that, another typical case, um, is a 32-year-old Afghan translator. He was uh, working for the UK forces as a translator, and the, uh, the Taliban didn't like that, so they, they broke into his house and they, uh, they shot him twice in the head uh, for his troubles. 
Uh, so they brought him in by Medevac. He's one of their guys. And, you know, as the, as with any organization, when you have somebody working with closely, whether he's Afghan or not, you try to take care of him. And, and so they, they brought him in. Um, so actually when he came in, he was actually talking and actually screaming, so which is a good sign in a gunshot wound to the head that the person's actually making any type of sound. Uh, and he was actually breathing on his own pretty well, and he had a good uh, vital signs were otherwise pretty good. So this is like gunshot wound to the head, and that's what they look like. Uh, these are 9mm gunshot wounds, one there, one there. Um, so anyways, we got him uh, set up, and uh, we uh, did all the protocol, including giving him tetanus, um, and uh, we got him to the CAT scan as fast as you can, because really you don't operate on uh, head wounds unless you have a CAT scan. So that was the CAT scan looks like. And this is, if you can imagine taking a slice through the head and taking a picture, this is his uh, skull going around here. Um, and this is, this is his brain here, this uh, gray stuff is his brain. And this is the track of the gunshot wound going right across his brain. Um, thankfully, this part of the brain is the your frontal area. And uh, I don't know if you, any of you remember when they used to do frontal lobotomies, is they used to take this part out. Um, so this guy was... I guess lucky enough to have this part damaged, uh, uh, but this is the part you really uh, you need this part here and you need this part over here, these parts back here. So, so anyways, what we did in the operating room, we took him to the operating room, uh, myself and one of the uh, neurosurgeons. We have one brain surgeon there who's a very busy guy. Um, so what I normally do, I would start the case. I would get the, open the skull, and get ready to then. Then when he was finishing the other case, he'd come in and. Uh, take a look at what was going on. So anyways, we took out the uh, big piece of skull, because uh, what you have to do is let the brain swell up, because the uh, brain doesn't like uh, to be uh, swollen in an enclosed place, so you let it swell up on its own. So anyways, um, let's see if this is going to work. So we got him through that, and that's, that's what the case looks like, uh, taking a big bone flap off and doing a craniotomy, just getting into the, the brain. So anyways, um, we got him extubated, uh, got the breathing tube out the next day, and he spoke English with an English accent, which was a big surprise. Uh, nobody expects that. Uh, so anyways, he did quite well, and we were able to send him to the, uh, the Kandahar Regional Military Hospital. And uh, he was having some behavioral problems because of his brain injury, but otherwise, uh, it, was, it was a pretty good story for him. I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Good question. Uh, like we said, we did see a lot of kids there, um, which is always uh, pretty heart-wrenching. Uh, a lot of them come in looking like this, and uh, sometimes there's just not too much you can do for them there. Uh, and this child, uh, it was actually a household accident, and uh, he had a big vat of boiling milk fall on him. And uh, he came in with about 50% burns and, and kidney failure. So he wound up dying of kidney failure. Um, and, you know, Afghanistan's a dangerous place, and children are falling down wells. They're uh, getting hit by cars. They're picking up pieces of explosives, and they're blowing up. So it's just a dangerous place for children. Uh, this child was shot in the head uh, in crossfire accidentally. This is an uh, AK-47 round. Sitting in the child's head. This is about a. Let's see, this, is um, this is uh, sitting right here. So, uh, anyway, we took the child to the operating room. We were able to get the bullets out. Uh, and the child was having seizures and other problems after the case. And uh, we were able to get the child to go home with the family. Uh, the family reportedly. Uh, they were traveling in a taxi, and uh, there was a convoy following them, and they reported that the family stopped the taxi, took the child out, left the child in the field, and it kept going. And so, uh, you know, and, I mean, you, you feel it for the parents, but they, you know, it's very difficult to look after a child that's having multiple seizures and other problems, uh, and maybe just not uh, realistic. Uh, this is a CAT scan of the child's head, again, showing a gunshot wound going across the child's head. Uh, the children out there, and I'm sure Dr. Godfrey recognizes these, this, uh, this, is, uh, this is a tapeworm. Um, a lot of children come in pretty skinny, and uh, 
And part of the problem is you know, not only poor nutrition, but a lot of them have a high parasite burden. And this is a large tapeworm. This, is about, this one was about uh, probably about 10 feet long, and this was out of a 12-year-old child um, that, we, uh, that I operated on. Um, so a lot of these children have a large parasite burden. Uh, this little fella, uh, he became, he was in the hospital for a long time, and uh, he came in and he was uh, injured in a roadside bomb, and uh, he had an abdominal surgery and vascular surgery, and uh, he had a complication caused by uh, myself and my colleagues uh, that we missed an injury. Uh, and that's one thing you know, learn in war surgery is, uh, you know, you miss things sometimes because there's too much going on, and... Uh, <coughs> This was in the setting of a, there was a rocket attack on the camp, and we had casualties coming in, and you're sort of being torn in about 20 different places trying to deal with all these uh, uh, these uh, other patients. And we missed an injury on him, and we wound up going back uh, about three weeks later and fixing it. Uh, uh, but uh, and he did well after that. Um, but you know, one thing um, uh, you know, I always stand out about this kid is. Uh, is uh, he was getting better on the war and he was becoming quite a little ham and he was uh, uh, started singing and uh, he was singing this song and uh, we asked one of the translators uh, you know, what is the uh, what's the song about and he goes oh it's nothing it's, it's the kid he made it up and uh, nothing was well what is he singing and he said well it's something like uh, he said uh, I thought I was dying so I was digging my grave I was building my headstone uh, but now I'm getting better so I put away my headstone for now. And, uh, and uh, you know, you realize that, you know, in Canada, if any kid was singing that, they would get an automatic psychiatry consult. Social work consult would be, they'd be all over that. But there, it's, it's kind of normal, and you can see why they, they would think that. And the other thing you notice about the kids there, too, is that, uh, you, you know, a kid, wounded kid comes in and gets getting a little bit better, and everybody wants to give the kid a toy or a, a stuffed animal or an ice cream or something. And uh, a lot of the kids, you give them a toy and they have no idea what it is. They, they don't want it, they haven't seen it before, and they just kind of push it away. And they have no idea what the, this thing is. And ice cream, chocolate, they, they have no idea what that is. So, uh, so it's really interesting to see, you know, but uh, kids being kids, if they're around long enough, they start warming up to certain people and they start playing with things. But, uh, but it's really interesting to see that they just have no concept of what we think being a child is. Um, this is another one of the patients, and I'll talk, address your question what happens to these people. Uh, this is one of the bad guys, um, our Taliban. Um, uh, so he uh, lost uh, both eyes. We had to take out both eyes and uh, take off both legs. And he was doing something uh, when he was hit by one of those uh, missile, Hellfire missiles from a, a drone. Uh, so he was doing something that he wasn't supposed to. And uh, we wound up putting a tracheostomy tube in him, too. Uh, and uh, so we resuscitated him and got him through this. And uh, this is about one day after the operation. So the question is, uh, well, we thought, well, maybe he's an intelligence asset. And so the, he was captured by the Australians. And he was captured by the Australians. So their intelligence people really were not interested in him. He was a low-level guy. And so... The question is now, what do you do with these people after this? You've saved the guy, and where do you put them? Well, this guy went to that uh, ho- uh, Red Cross hospital in Kandahar City. Um, and, uh, you know, what kind of life is he going to have? And even more immediately, uh, what kind of care is he going to get there? Um, so I imagine we don't have any follow-up data from these people, but I imagine many of them don't do very well because a lot of it is dependent on how much their families can provide and support for them. So I have no idea how many of these patients did. Uh, they're just lost to our follow-up. Um, but it is uh, an ethical question that that does come up in conversations that uh, that we have is that uh, well, our fellows, they get to go back to Canada and uh, their, their people get to go back to local resources. Um, you know, is there really the same standard of care? And so uh, but our objective is because we we treat everybody the same that comes through the door. We do the same standard of care, uh, and uh, and we try to keep our casualty or mortality rate as low as possible. 
but it is, does raise a lot of ethical questions, and I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer those because you know I do my job and uh, and I leave it to uh, other people to sort out those uh, questions. But it, it does make you wonder. Uh, so Operation Attention, which I came back from uh, in uh, late December, is the uh, is the sort of extension of the mission that ended in Kandahar. So right now, there are no Canadian troops in Kandahar. We do not have any medics working in Kandahar. That operation is completely closed down. So what we did start in uh, end of October um, is a medical training mission as part of Op Attention, and it started in uh, Mazar-e-Sharif and, and Kabul. So with the objective is trying to pass on the security responsibilities and the logistic and support responsibilities to our Afghan allies um, and so that we can leave uh, in, by 2014. So uh, we started the operation this summer. There's multiple Canadian uh, people there. So it's about, it's capped at 950. Um, so we've got people uh, training at hospitals, we've got training, people training administrative roles, and we also have uh, other uh, arms of the Canadian Forces uh, training uh, infantrymen and other, uh, other organizations. So this is what kind of the Afghan army looks like. Uh, we were on a big uh, Afghan training base in uh, Mazar Sharif uh, called Camp Shaheen. And, uh, you notice that uh, one thing you notice when the Afghans are doing training is all the uh, students will sort of squat on their haunches in big circles while their instructors are talking and will sit like that for hours listening to their instructors. Uh, so it must be uh, very uncomfortable. But that's, uh, that's one thing you notice. And in a lot of ways, uh, there's some, a lot of Soviet influences to the Afghan uh, military system. And, and you see that there in terms of their marching and, and drill, etc. So where I was in Mazar Sharif, so it's actually up, it was up in the north. It's, this is uh, just near the uh, the mountains are here, the Hindu Kush. So we're actually on the other side of the Hindu Kush here, and uh, close to Iran. So there's a lot of uh, Iranian influence in the area, and also close to Uzbekistan there. So this is just a view from the camp, and so we're sort of surrounded by these, uh, these sort of beautiful mountains. And I can tell you, it was, it was pretty cold out there in the, in the winter time. It was, uh, it, was, it was pretty chilly. I, I think after being in Kandahar, I was more prepared for, you know, uh, you know, 25 at least in the winter time. But there, it was, it could be, uh, it was quite chilly at night. Uh, just another view, and the camp was on. It was about uh, 2,000, maybe 1,500 uh, coalition troops, and we were sort of surrounded by, uh, just in the middle of a. Uh, the Afghan National Army camp, and there's about 10,000 Afghan National Army uh, soldiers there. And just a picture of the local uh, infrastructure. So, going up to Mazar Sharif, there was some security concerns initially, and still persist. Uh, so, this is the place in uh, in the summer, in, in uh, I guess it was in the spring, that the uh, somebody in Florida they burned. Uh, uh, Quran on a barbecue, and uh, they rioted in uh, Mazar Sharif. And actually, they overran the UN compound, and they killed some Nepalese troops, and also killed some of the United Nations staff working there. Uh, when I was there on uh, December 6, uh, uh, Shura, which is a Shia holiday, uh, there was a bombing. Uh, it was a bicycle born bomb, and we received multiple casualties uh, from the, from the bombing there. Uh, probably the biggest thing that we'll, that worry that was on everybody's mind is that uh, the green on blue casualties. Uh, uh, that's when uh, one of our Afghan partners, or presumed Afghan partners, uh, turns his weapon on a coalition trainer and uh, kills him. And, and 20% of the uh, soldiers uh, killed in Afghanistan this year have been killed by uh, their, their trainees or mentees. Uh, so it makes you, makes you a little bit concerned because... Um, there's a lot of uh, you know committed people in the Afghan army, but there's a lot of people that um, their actual loyalties are not well known. And the Afghan army is, uh, I'm sure many of you know, is a very poor structure with people deserting all the time, coming back in, and 
And uh, these people are not getting great security clearances to uh, join uh, the Afghan army. So that, and that's constantly on your mind when you're, when you're working there. Uh, the living facilities there were somewhat rustic, especially for a doctor. Uh, uh, so we were bunk beds and these plywood shacks in the wintertime and uh, uh, with the, the latrines with, with latrines about 200 feet away. So, I, you know, you did feel kind of feel maybe a little bit mash-like living in this, uh, this facility here. Um, the Afghans themselves there, uh, a lot of them were glad to see us, and, but there's a bit of reticence on their part because uh, they've seen people come and go, and so... Uh, they're not really sure uh, how long we're going to be there or uh, what's in it for them, really. So, uh, so working with them was a very interesting experience. Um, and but uh, you know, there's we're I, we're the first people off there, so there's we're still trying to build trust and uh, a relationship with these fellows. So the operating rooms in Afghanistan, the, the actual hospital was built by the Americans, and it's, it was pretty well furnished actually, as. Um, it was probably built along the lines of a 1960s U.S. hospital, so it was a new facility, and, and a lot of the equipment was new. Uh, the big problem is still for them is is trying to bring people's medical standards up from where they're sitting. Probably the um, and sometimes it's hard to place where their medical standards are sitting, uh, depending on the on the person you're talking to. Uh, but you're trying to bring their standards up to a reasonable level of quality of care to provide for their soldiers. And that's what we were trying to do. Um, certainly, a lot of the practices there were very different uh, for us. And, uh, and you know, trying to get them to do some uh, basic techniques and be a little more aggressive with some of their trauma patients uh, was, could be certainly challenging. Uh, this is myself with some of the Afghan, uh, Afghan surgeons there. And, uh, and uh, you know, their, their training system is very different. They are trained on a Soviet system, so it's very dogmatic. Um, so there's only one right way to do thing, things, and you don't do anything else unless somebody tells you to do it. Um, so, so trying to get around that in terms of the critically thinking and problem solving, sometimes very difficult to, uh, to get them to think that way. Uh, one thing I did enjoy there is this fellow next to me was uh, he was a was a chai boy. Or he would be uh, the guy who would make my tea in the morning and he would make sure you had breakfast and he was kind of like your bodyguard type guy. So you had your, your own personal assistant. Uh, so he didn't speak much English, but uh, I mean it was uh, anyway. So it was something. And certainly, if I'm applying for any jobs, I'll definitely ask for somebody like that in the contract. But uh, and just to wrap up my talk is. A couple other images from Afghanistan is uh, this is uh, a, a wild lynx that's in the Kandahar region and uh, and uh, that they trapped on the base and uh, the uh, the vets the American vets have um, a facility there and they would uh, immunize them against rabies and distemper etc and tag them and release them back on the camp to keep down on the rodent population there. Um, this is a mongoose. Um, uh, this is the, those who read uh, Roger Kipling general book. This is the same thing. It's Ricky Tiki Tavi, and uh, this was this was trapped on a Canadian fob, and uh, so it was caught in a rat trap. And uh, they had uh, one person uh, is interested in animals, tried to pick it up, and uh, of course he got bit. And, uh, and uh, as Dr. Godfrey was pointing out earlier, is that. Um, you know, Afghanistan does have a very high incidence of rabies. Uh, so now you've got a guy who's been bitten by this thing, and uh, and so what do you do? So well, he was started on uh, rabies uh, immunization series, and they want to get the guy back to work. It's not agreeing with them. And there's only one way to definitely prove an animal doesn't have rabies, and that's uh, to subject its brain to autopsy. So now what do you do with this thing? And Well, we don't have pathology in Afghanistan, so uh, what do you do with it? We have to get it to Germany somehow. And, uh, so, so this is where it's getting into a MASH-type scenario, um, or maybe combat hospital-type type scenario. So, so the initial plan was the U.S. Air Force was going to fly it to Germany on a troop plane, but then somebody said, well, what if it escaped and it started biting people on the plane? Uh, we, we, we can't have that. Then the next thing is, and the next thing was, well, let's uh, let's put it on a transport plane with a cargo and 
things. Well, what if it got lost? And then what would we do? And so the final answer is they put it on an executive jet by itself. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, and it's somewhat... The irony is, is that so many people are dying to get out of... They do anything to get out of Afghanistan. And this little guy, minding his own business, and he bites something trying to pick him up, and he gets shipped out on a plane. And so in the end, he wound up being observed, and he, he wound up in a zoo in Germany. So he, so, so he got a nice life out of this. Uh, so anyways, that's the nature of my talk. Um, um, I, I just to run it up, it's just... Uh, you know, in war surgery, I mean, there's some sites that live, live with you forever. And I've just got a couple more images. Uh, um, but you just see this day after day, you know, and, uh, and uh, so, I mean, the images just keep coming. So, uh, uh, so I'll stop my talk, talk there. But uh, anyways, I, and I think the sacrifice that some people have made uh, in terms of this mission and uh, the great work that all members of the Canadian Forces Health Service has done in uh, keeping so many of these people alive and preventing more uh, disability has been tremendous. And for me, it's been, uh, it was a real privilege to go there um, and uh, work in that environment. And uh, despite the fact that we're not as good looking as Combat Hospital, I, think, I say our lives were even more exciting than theirs were on the TV show. Thank you. Group, but I, what I can tell you is every base has uh, an operational stress uh, a center. And there's there's several of them across the country where people can go for support. Uh, um, also, on almost every base, there's a warrior support center that deal with uh, family and uh, domestic type issues. Uh, I think you know when I did the tours in the 1990s, uh, I remember we had our our stress debriefing by the sergeant major coming back and goes. I don't want to hear about any problems when you guys get back there. No, you know, no drinking. I don't want to hear any problems with their wives, etc. And I think that attitude has really changed in the last, uh, especially the last five years. Uh, that you know, it's recognized that operational stress injury or PTSD is is a real uh, affliction of being exposed to uh, combat um, combat operations and being deployed. Uh, so I think it's a, it's really taken much more seriously now and. Uh, and 